Well, I'd like to introduce myself. I, I am David Taylor, and I grew up in Valerico, Brandon area, and I grew up in Orange Grove. We had orange groves, and I worked the groves, and we had gardens, and so that was kind of my background. I was an electrical contractor until recently, and in 2008, when the recession hit, we laid off all of our employees, and I thought, what am I going to do? I haven't had a garden in 25 years. I better get busy and start some research and see how I can grow things and learn to grow things in case things get extremely difficult. So my first endeavor was hydroponics. I, that was a few years back, I started with hydroponics. I did all the research on the internet. I experimented with different things, um, started having success. I started a community garden, Faith Covenant Church. They let us use some property and I started a community garden, which is an organic garden. And this is the sixth year of operation. And recently, if you try to find it, it's FCC Community Garden, but we just changed it to Edgemore Community Garden because that's our area of town. First of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about hydroponics and aquaponics and the similarities between the two. Hydroponics and aquaponics is the art of growing plants without soil. These are the different systems, the raft system, the wick system, ebb and flow, the nutrient film system, the drip system, aeroponics and aquaponics. And as we go through these systems, I'll explain the systems and tell you which ones that you use in hydroponics and aquaponics, or you, we use some of the systems, we use both. For each of these systems, we have to have a container, some type of medium, air, water. We have to adjust the pH so the plants will grow, and we have some type of fertilizer. The RAF system is widely used in hydroponics, and we grow a lot of uh, lettuce type crops and you have usually some type of wrap which is styrofoam usually and you have little net cups and the water level is usually right close to the bottom of these cups and you have an air pump which aerates the water and you have uh, a mixture of water and fertilizer. And this is mainly used in hydroponics. And you can see the roots on these plants. Then you have the wick system. And this is basically what earth box is. With the earth box, you have a column of soil that acts as a wick. But sometimes people use cloth, um, old rags, preferably cotton to hang in the reservoir, and this is mainly for hydroponics. The ebb and flow system, this is used in hydroponics and aquaponics. And you, you can see the water is pumped in the top tank, that's the grow bed up here, and then it flows down to the reservoir and there's an air pump in there and then it continues the cycle over and over and over again. And this is some examples, uh, commercially grown beds. Then you have the nutrient film technique and this is used both in aquaponics and hydroponics. And you have a pump and you just have a a film that goes down, a, usually it's a trough that looks sort of like a rain gutter. It could be four inch PVC and it's usually gravity fed. There's a slight slope on it 
and it returns back into your nutrient tank. Then you have a drip system. This is where you have your pump and it just goes up to some type of manifold and it drips at each plant. This is used in Dutch bucket type system. It's used in hydroponics and aquaponics. These are just towers that the drip is fed in the top and it just goes down the towers. Uh, you can grow all kinds of crops in here, but mainly they grow strawberries. And then these are tomato plants. Now aeroponics is kind of the same thing, except they use a spray. They break down the water into a fine mist and it actually just sprays on the roots. There's a lot of towers, Epcot, you'll see this system over at Disney. Then we have your typical aquaponic system. And this is a ebb and flow system where it continually pumps up and it fills up and drains. In aquaponics, we have the fish. They produce their waste and ammonia. It's turned into bacteria. It fertilizes the plants and the plants remove the nutrients and filter the water and it returns back to the fish. Now in a commercial system, which produces the greatest income, the fish or the vegetables? They get 70% of their money from the vegetables they raise and not the fish. Our growing mediums that we use in aquaponics are perlite, very little sand, some people use sand, uh, lava rock, clay pellets, and peat rock. Uh, I would say perlite and clay pellets are what are used through most systems. Hydrotonic expandable pellets, they were made in Germany and there's other companies that make them in the U.S. now. And it's just a fired clay pellet that expands and it's very lightweight and it's got air pockets all inside. Then your typical peat rock, your perlite. In your aquaponic system, you can raise fish, generally tilapia we're speaking about, from pH of six to eight. Um, <clears throat> fish can sometimes survive lower than that, but that's generally the best range so the fish aren't stressed out. But a problem with that, your plants do better around the six and a half to 6.6 .6 the pH. But for breeding fish, the fish will not breed at that low of pH. And so they have to have somewhere between seven and eight pH to breed. And this is just what I've, I've found and experimented. Uh, I know some of the commercial uh, growers, they keep their pH right about seven. And this shows you the pH range for all plants. And so it shows you what the perfect pH should be. I just use a cheap pH test kit. Uh, you can buy pH meters. Uh, they're about $70 and they have little tips that you have to keep clean and they corrode and you have a lot of problems with them. This is a cheap kit. It's only about under $5 and it works well. When we have our fish in the tank and we're growing plants and we're going through the cycle, the pH tends to drift down unless you change your water, where you should have a 10 to 20% water change a week. When I first started my systems, I wasn't changing the water often enough. So what happened is my pH dropped to about five and a half, and I was losing fish. 
and they started dying and floating to the top and I couldn't figure it out. It took me a while. I didn't know if there was some type of parasite. Their gills looked fine. There wasn't any marks on them. And so I finally found the problem was pH. But in this area, our tap water, which we normally use, the pH is neutral, which is seven. So as you add the tap water to your fish tank and do a 10 to 20% change a week, your pH tends to drift up. So I try to keep my pH down about six and a half. So what I do is just use muriatic acid. If you add too much acid to the water, you're going to kill the bacteria and kill your system. So you have to be very careful. If you add too much too often, you're gonna stress the fish. So if you add a tablespoon per 200 gallons of water and you let it set for a couple days and then take a reading, and then if you need to lower it more, you add another batch. This is a commercial air pump. They run around $70. And the system I have is a 250 gallon system. I use a IBC tank and it holds uh, 275 gallons of water. This is an airlift pump, and you can use this instead of a little circulating pump. How it works, you have a blower or air pump, and you're putting air down at the bottom of the tube, and it bubbles up and forces water out. As long as you have whatever depth this is, you can put, pump water half of that distance. So. If you only have a shallow tank, which my tank's four foot high, I can only lift that water two feet. This explains how aquaponics works. You feed the fish, they produce ammonia waste, and too much of that waste is toxic, and the fish can't withstand a high nitrate level. The bacteria is then grown in the grow beds. It breaks down this ammonia into nitrates and nitrites. The plants convert the nitrates into nutrients, and then the nutrients are the fertilizer. Uh, the roots also help filter the water, and the system is filtered out through the grow beds and the bacteria in the rocks. You can put earthworms in your grow bed, and you say, worms in water? The bed fills up with water and you want it to take, no matter how big your bed is, you want to take it about 15 minutes to fill up. And the bed drains and pulls air in and the worms are in there and they are eating the bacteria and they're putting out their waste and adding to the nutrients in the grow bed. The type of tilapia I use is a blue tilapia. They are legal here in Florida. There are certain tilapia that some of the commercial fishermen use that you have to have a license to have. Uh, the blue tilapia are hardy for cooler temperatures. And when you're starting a new system, you want one fish per 10 gallons of water. And you say, that's not very many fish. Well, that fish is gonna grow to hopefully over a pound. So you're looking at the end of his life and what he's going to need as far as water. Now, an established system that you've had going for six months, and if you have plenty of aeration through air pump and air stones, you can have two fish per 10 gallons or one fish per five gallons. There are a lot of people that started backyard aquaponics and they didn't know about this temperature range, especially a little north of here. When I started my system, I started looking everywhere online and I found so many people selling IBC tanks and they were for their fish and they gave up. Their fish died. If that water gets to 50 degrees, your fish are gonna start floating. 
generally. And they're gonna be so stressed and they're gonna die. And you may wanna know what do you do right now when it's gonna be 47 tonight. Well, yesterday I went out and I turned my pumps off. Made sure, poured water in my grow beds to make sure they siphoned out and all the water, there's only about that much water in the grow bed. So tonight when I got home, I filled my grow beds up so they would, bell siphon would flush again and the roots would have some moisture in it. I also used city water, which the temperature is probably, I would say, somewhere around 75 degrees. So that added a little heat to my system. So I'll do that for the next few days until it warms up a little bit. You have to remember, you can't do over 20% change of water with our tap water with chlorine in it. You can take the water with chlorine in it, you can let it set out for 24 hours and the chlorine will dissipate. Um, I just never do more than 20% water change. Or I have rainwater storage for my roof and I use that. This is an IBC tank that there's different places that have them. You want to make sure you have a food grade tank. They ship Coke syrup in it, um, olive oil, everything they ship around the world. So these are available. There's your air pump. And here's a little pump hit. I'm trying to remember that one is 364 gallons an hour is what it pumps. And it's 120 volt. This is an old water softener tank that I got and ripped everything out and I made a swirl filter and I'll show you later how that works. But what that does is from the fish tank, the water goes up there and swirls around and the solids drop to the bottom. And then I have a little hose and I can drain that out into a bucket and put it on the plants in the ground that I've got. There's three IBC tanks here. And I'm lucky enough to have a friend that works for Valpac and they use aluminum plates on their presses. They're about the size, thickness of a tin can. And they use the plate one time and scrap them. So he brought me a bunch of plates and they had, they were green and had all the, the writing because they're uh, photoactive and so in the sun they eventually turned gray and I did that so we wouldn't grow algae in my storage tanks I took one of the IBC tanks and cut actually a third of it off and kept the bottom third and that's my grow bed I have peat rock in there and that tank is 40 inches by 48 and 18 inches high it weighs a thousand pounds it's so heavy and I've got it on four by fours on top of this water tank I took a 55 gallon barrel and split it in half and I've used that for different things. I'll show you in other pictures. And I actually made a little solar heater. It's made out of uh, CPVC. And I painted it black. It's got a piece of plexiglass over it. And I have it set up on a thermostat. So when that panel is 80 degrees, it'll turn on a little pump and circulate water but when it's this cold, it cannot keep up. This is just another angle, my squirrel filter. And a picture, th this is when I first started out with the system. I changed it a little bit and I'll explain why. 
This is the inside of a swirl filter. You can have your water come anywhere. Mine actually comes in the side over here. You have two 45s that are bent like this. So when the water is pumped up from your growth or your fish tank, it swirls in there. It just goes in a circle and the solids settle down to the bottom. And then you have an outlet, that's just a 90 turned up and it drains out. Now this is below the outlet, probably a good foot. When I first started my system, there's a little tilapia and I just put some goldfish in there too, just to get the system started. And that lets you see how big the tilapia were. There was a guy up in Oldsmar that I found on Craigslist, which he is no longer selling fish, but he lived out in the country and he had a swimming pool and it was pure pea green and he had thrown a dozen tilapia in there and three years later he had so many tilapia he didn't know what to do with. And his wife wouldn't let him, she loved to go out there and feed them. You use a floating fish food. And she wouldn't let him catch any of them or do anything with them. This is a 55 gallon barrel I cut in half. And I tried growing duckweed. Duckweed grows in a few ponds in the area, but it's very invasive and most places spray their ponds to kill it. If you go up 49th Street, right before you get on the Bayside Bridge, on the left, as you're going north, the left side, there's a big retention pond in there and it's covered with dollar weed. So that's where I would go and get it at 55 gallon barrels. The problem is in the summer, when it likes to grow, this water gets too hot. It's not deep enough. And so the water gets too hot and the duckweed wouldn't grow. And the tilapia love duckweed. You can see the little solar panel. There's just a three quarter header there and one there and then just half inch pipes going down. You can see some celery and how well it's growing. This is the system that I, I changed. I opened up my fish tank before I just had an opening about this big on it. Well, it was pretty hard to net the fish. And they are so sneaky, they can get down in any corner. I tried a tiny little hook and bread balls and I caught a couple and that was it. They are very smart. So the best way is to drain the system but your fish grow at different levels. So you can put all the same size tilapia in there at the same time. One might be this big and one might be this big after nine months. The swirl tank was right here. And so I moved it. This is coming out of the swirl tank. This is how I feel, fill the tank. Right here, I added an overflow. And what happened one time, the drain got stuck and I came home and I had about that much water in my fish tank and it was overflowing. The IVC tank plastic is right about there. And I left the metal cage about that much higher so I could put a little wooden border around and screw my aluminum plate on so it would just overflow. So I did that as a safety drain. There's my swirl tank and this is coming out the other side of the swirl tank and I ended up mixing some peat gravel and hydrocone pellets, clay pellets in here and I've got tomatoes and kale and onions and I ended up, I had all kinds of tomatoes this year in my aquaponics and hydroponics, but I got late blight. You can see the leaves are starting to really turn. Some onions and 
some tomatoes, some green beans. I had green beans over on a fence line and they finished and I pulled them up and I put sugar snap peas out. Well, some of the green beans pods had fallen and they went to seed, so I pulled them up and put them over here. But with this weather, my sugar snap peas haven't done a thing and it's just been way too hot. Now with, with my systems, I have an electrical contractor background. So I believe in safety around water, so I use a GFI receptacle to protect myself in case I'm reaching in the water. My fish are dead and I'm reaching in the water and I'm wet and I don't have a GF, or now they're called GFCIs. I don't have one and I might be electrocuted. So I believe in safety because if you had a GF CI in there, you would just feel a little tingle and it would trip. The problem with that is sometimes they just trip. I went out about a month ago and my nothing was flowing. I had been working late every night and I hadn't checked it in about three days and I went out there and the water felt kind of smelt kind of fishy and a little bit of strong and I said uh-oh and I went and I checked and my GFCI had tripped. I have a battery backup system my batteries were dead so I don't know how long it had been that way. With your aquaponic system you want a backup if, if your air pumps not working but your water is flowing and your grow beds are filling up and draining it's pulling oxygen into your water so you need a battery backup you need I just use a little bilge pump I took two old car batteries that wouldn't start a car anymore and tied them together and then you have a relay and what you do, the easy way you hook this up, the relay is 120 volt to the coil, and then you have a normally closed and normally open and a common. This is your pump. You tie everything to your normally closed and common. So when you lose power, it operates that relay and opens this, that point. So when you lose power, it goes back to this state. And it runs that pump. Then on your plumbing, what you have to do, if you have two pumps, you have to have a check valve in each pump because if your 120 volt pump was running and it was pumping water up, it would go right back down this one. So if you have a check valve so it can't flow down, it goes up. And the same thing if your 12 volt pump's on. There's my hydroponics, there's my tomatoes. And I have just buckets with the corners cut out. I'm growing beets. And then these are my little troughs that I grow lettuce and chard. And here's some more of my Dutch buckets, which is a drip system. All right, can you uh, reading your fish in your system? Well, with this, with this system, I keep the pH so low they won't breed. Okay, I don't have that problem. I had a koi fish pond right in this area where I've got my garden, and I put the tilapia in there, and that's how the pH is eight, and that's where I'm growing my babies in a separate system. And commercially what they do is they usually take the mother fish when she starts laying, she lays eggs, they're fertilized and she keeps them in her mouth. And they, yeah, they, they put them in another tank to separate. Because when the tilapia are young, they are, aren't vegetarians like they are when they're old, 
they need meat, they will be carnivores that eat the babies. They need a lot more protein when they're young. Uh, they use different types of food when they're young compared to when they're old. I was talking about duckweed. One thing I found is the tilapia love sweet potato vines. So in the summers when I'm growing sweet potatoes, and at my community garden, they're growing all in the rows. I go around and trim other people's sweet potato vines out of the rows, and I take them home and feed the fish. Have you ever used the hydrilla? I think the hydrilla gives the babies a place to hide, and also they eat just the little roots. Now that's in my fish pond, I have hydrilla, and they do, but, but they don't destroy it. I mean, it's still. Yes. Um, how long does it take before you, the fish are big enough to eat? Okay, it depends on the temperature, because when it's cooler, they don't grow as often. Okay. For me, it takes me about a year. To get one fish? Yes. And what, what are you feeding them? There, there's a commercial fish food that you can feed. I bought uh, organic food that was really expensive when I started out. I had read something on the internet, and you may think this is crazy, um, and I tried it, and this is all I'm using right now, and it also has, has to do with how fast they're growing. I use rabbit food for bunnies, and feed, and they love it. They grow, the plants grow well. I'm not really that interested in the fish, I'm more interested in the plants. It, yes? Um, how feasible would it be just to make a pond and grow right in just one big container with the fish and maybe have it like separated off with plants on the okay. side? I, I think that would work great, but with a pond you're going to have to aerate it a lot because you have so much with hydrolinol, you have so much vegetation that dies, and you get this muck on the bottom, and... So you'd have to clean it out. I, I clean mine about once a year, my pond. And, and I'm not an expert. This is just, just from trial and error, what, what I found, what I've observed, and... With, you have to be very patient. Um, I went to a few seminars, just an afternoon seminar on raising tilapia, and I was told if you can start out small like this and you can have success, you won't have any problem on a larger scale because I'm having to worry about controlling water temperature because I only have 200 and 50 gallons actually in the tank at any time. The rest is up in grow beds. Um, just, just everything is so much, the mistakes you make really cost you when you're working with such a small scale. You know, if you had a 2,000 ga gallon tank, you don't have to worry about the temperature fluctuating. Yes. Have you done any cost-effective comparisons for um, aquaponics versus conventional gardening? Well, it, it cost me five hundred dollars to set this up because I poured slabs. I, you know, this is small scale, and I did it mainly as an experiment, and I wanted to learn. Um, Hydroponics is so much easier. It's so much more forgiving. Uh, you know, if you have a pump quit and you catch it that afternoon, you've got wilted plants and you can go out and miss the plants and then put water on the roots and most of the time they'll come back. Uh, but the aquaponics isn't quite as forgiving. You know, you really need to check the aquaponics every day you need to, you know, and then if you go on vacation, what do you do?
Yes. Is there uh, effective uh, organic hydroponics now? I know for a while it was very difficult. I mean, there is organic food that you can buy. Um, you, you said, oh, hydroponics. I thought you said aquaponics. Hydroponics, it, it's really hard to do organically because it's so hard to, to find your nutrients are stable enough. I've experimented some and tried, and I haven't had any luck. Yes? You mentioned that you know, the stimulus was in 2008 was sort of a crisis intervention, and, and it appeared a very complex <coughs> as a first time out. I wonder why you picked this as opposed to a traditional garden. Well, well, when I started, when I first started out, it wasn't this complex. It was, it was some, it was five foot, uh, th three inch PVC, four and five foot long, and a little tub for my nutrients. And I used uh, plastic cups that I, actually burnt holes in which I shouldn't have done uh, and I used uh, cypress chips and I just I started out real simple uh, yes yeah we hear a lot about the treatment of the root system what about the lighting what do you do as far as the treatment of the lighting of the plant itself no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, everything is outside. Everything I have is outside. Now, on my back porch, I start a lot of my plants. I've got a table, and I, I made LED lights to put over there to start my plants. And I, you know, I tend to, see something I want to do and I try to research and I just jump right into it. So, <coughs> yes. Is there a relationship between the, uh, say, the square footage of your growing space and the, either the amount of water uh, that you have for fish or the number of fish? What's the, what's there is and I don't have that formula. Like, whoop, I have the 250 gallons and I could, I could support probably three times as much growing area as I have with that. Um, about 14 square feet and I'd say maybe 24 square feet. So I don't have that, that much. You could go three times. Yes. And there's formulas on the net that you can, you know, get. Yes. Okay, so between, like, with the, the aquaponics, the cost of the feed for the fish is really what you're paying for. Right. What's the comparison between that and hydroponics where you're having to buy the, the nutrients? The nutrients are very cheap. They're cheap. So which would be, cost-wise, what would you say? for the same amount of alcohol. I'd say the hydroponics is a little cheaper. Now with it, I use a lot of perlite. So you're, you are buying some perlite. This is like a four gallon bucket. And so I, I'm using perlite in there with my tomatoes. And in these buckets, I'm using that's a little upside down net cup, but I'm using a net cup about this big and it's just setting in a bucket and it's full of hydrotone little clay pellets and I'm growing in that and it's a drip system where I'm just feeding down and then it drains back into a, a barrel. Does your broccoli taste like fish? <laughs> no. Um, work wise, once you have both systems up, the aquaponics isn't as much work as the hydroponics. 
because it's a lot easier to take your root, the roots and everything out of your clay pellets or your rock, peat rock, and get everything out than trying to, when you have a little net cup, the six or eight inch net cups is about this deep and about this big around, your roots just saturate your clay pellets and it's, it's almost like concrete when the, you harvest the plant and take the plant out. And so, you know, you either try to salvage some of that or you hydrotone is not very cheap. Have you ever seen any attempt at, at comparing uh, aqua-grown food as opposed to well-grown soil food? And the nutrient content. Well, right off the bat, I would say your aquaponics would have higher nutrient value, I would think, than hydroponics. J just because I can take the fish water, when I change it, I save it, and I go around and put it on my plants in the soil, and it makes a huge difference. Uh, G Janae Tropical out on Central. When we had, several years ago, we had the big freeze. She lost about 80, she was gonna lose 80% of her plants. And she has a friend that raises aquaponics and she brought her fish water over in 55 gallon barrels and they watered all of her plants. And she couldn't believe the difference in how many plants made it that she said never would have made it. And uh, I mean, that, you know, that's one of the aquaponics, that's one benefit, just the fish water. Uh, this one lady, she sells it for a dollar a gallon. Yes. All right, so I have a couple of questions. With, uh, in regards to the IBC containers, I mean, I see IBC containers all over the place. And I notice they have different color lids, tops. And I understand that those different color lids signify what it was used for previously, so you don't have to take the word for it, whoever owns it, that it was a, uh, if your words were, food grade tank. Do you know what color variations you can use? Every, everything, I, I'm trying to think, everything I ever got was, was uh, red. red. Now, you know, I don't know if they were honest with me what was in there either. Well, usually when you open up, you find out pretty quick. Yes. <laughs> and very often there's a label on it, a paper label. It's right. And if you get Sometimes those are gone, though. I went over to Plant City and bought mine from an animal feed store. There's a place right on Cogway, just east of Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, most of the time I use rainwater. But then what's in that when it comes off the roof? Now, when I use a, for a, a hydroponics, I use part per million meters, so that's how I know how much fertilizer I have in. If I do a parts per million on my rainwater is about 40. City water is 560. My deep well water is 1500 because of salt intrusion. So. That's also nutrient rich. Pardon me? I mean, your well water you're talking about, it has, uh, it's a little saline, but that's also, you don't use it in your hydroponics anyways, the natural sea salt. 
Now there's there's a guy in Sarasota that with his hydroponics he uses seawater and he puts 20% seawater in his in with his city water and that's to get all the nutrients and No. You, you need a large body of water that the temperature is going to stay pretty consistent and not, you know. I, I've talked to different people that tried to grow it in little plastic swimming pools and to feed their fish. And yeah, I, I, I've been growing it in a swimming pool, so I have a little bit of an advantage. My swimming pool, you were talking about an old farm. Mm -hmm. Right. And I only cover half of the water with that. And um, uh, it's been like it just grows and grows and I have it, you know, I don't I don't feed them regular fish food, uh, you know, or the rabbit food, which I'm gonna look into because that sounds interesting. But I'll like feed mine or the, the the smaller fry, I just use uh, uh, I do throw worms in there. Mm -hmm. Now I, I do add iron to the system about once a month. I put about two uh, tablespoons of iron once a month. That's the only thing I really have to add. fish species that are recommended for this area? Most people in this area use tilapia because they are so forgiving. Like I said, you know, my, my water, I don't know how long it had stopped running, how many days, but I know my batteries went dead. The, the water actually smelled, I figured they were dead in the bottom and they were all alive. I didn't lose one. so. They are a very forgiving fish. And, you know, they'll live in brackish water. Just any of these little streams or canals around here have tilapia in them. Yes? You said something about removing chlorine. How do you do that? You have to buy an agent that'll remove it. It's the only way. Pardon me? Uh, what do you use to remove chloramine? That, they used to put it in the water here and then we switched back to chlorine. I thought they were still using chloramine. We went back to We went back. Fluoride, chloramine. Chloramine, fluoride. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when 
whenever I was using regular city water, I was getting algae blooms and there was a lot more stuff to deal with until I started removing that new active carbon and then that all went away. And I didn't have all the algae and the junk. Your fish will not take care of the algae? I'm talking about the grow bed part. Oh, the grow bed. Oh, okay. Now one thing I didn't, um, <clears throat> my computer wouldn't hook up here and I borrowed Bill's and I wasn't sure why it's not playing, but I had a video explaining a bell siphon and that's one of the keys to your grow bed. And what a bell siphon does, it's actually a tube this way and a little tube this way. The tube comes all the way down. The water rises up in here and then runs over this tube and it causes a suction and it drains the water out like that out of your tank and then it, down at the bottom it has some holes in it and it breaks it's called a vacuum break it lets air in there and so it'll fill up because your water constantly runs into your grow bed it never stops and you want to fill that tank in about 15 to 20 minutes. You don't want to fill it too rapidly. And another thing that on my swirl tank, I'm pumping water up in my swirl tank. I have a valve there where I can regulate how fast it comes in. Because if you put water into your grow beds too fast, your bell siphon won't work for properly. It'll never empty, it'll just spill over and your bed will be half full of water and your roots will be drowned. So that was one of the keys I wish I could have showed you. Any more questions? Yes. yes. Where do you get those big ideas? Where do you look for them? If you just get on the internet mm -hmm. and Google IBC tank, uh, IBC. tank, uh -huh. uh, there's a guy that sells them locally, but he's about 150 a piece. Uh -huh. um, but you know, it's been quite a while since I bought them, so. Last They'll last a long time. You know, and, and that's that's another thing that we really haven't talked about, and that's a whole nother story is plastics. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at I'm doing all this stuff and I'm doing it in plastic and I, I have fifty-five gallon blue barrels cut in half that I've got all around my fence line that I'm growing things in, you know, and, and I just wonder it, how much of that plastic is really. You can see any of these. Yes. So you're lying on the pipe, who knows how that is. And these, these uh, tubs, after they're about four years ago, four years old, they get brittle and they break. So when they start getting brittle, I get rid of them. And that's one reason I started organic garden in the ground, <laughs> the community garden. Yes. Do you grow in, still grow in the, gar in the ground as well as the? Yes. The yes. And, and so you feel that uh, doing all three is uh, giving you some diversity and some greater capacity? Well, with the hydroponics in a small area, you can grow the most uh, of any method. It produces most. I have an area about 10 by 10. All this stuff is in a 10 by 10 area and I've got a uh, canopy over it with the plastic to keep the dew off and the rain off. And I put shade cloth up and I can grow so much in that little area. And at home we juice fruits and vegetables every day and so I tend to grow things I use. Onions. Onions seem to do well. Uh, I tried beets and they didn't do well. Um, mainly uh, 
I'm thinking chard did well, kale, and I just planted just four little green bean bush plants and they're doing well. Celery always does real well. Uh, I tried cucumbers, but the cucumber, the roots just saturate everything and, and just take over, so. Is there anything you have not been able to grow in the aquaponics system? Uh, like I said, beets didn't do well. Um, oh, anything like that. Uh, peppers, you've got to kind of mound the, the rocks up a little higher to keep the roots up a little because the water comes within an inch of the top of the rock. If you get any higher than that, then you get a lot of mildew and algae and the rocks turn green. So I only have it come up within about an inch. Yes, rocks, water comes within an inch of the top of the rocks. 